the Woodland Cemetery Jane Doe, identified as Edith Patton. This one starts out in Sanford, Maine. A woman's remains were found in 2017, but in actuality, they had been there for 126 years, since 1891. Workers were digging at a construction site with the goal of digging a new water line on Main Street in Sanford, Maine. They had planned to build a gas station and a convenience store. I hate that sometimes I sound like a beginning of Bones or a Law and Order episode, but the truth is that much to their horror, in this case, life imitates TV, or perhaps TV imitates life. Either way, a construction worker did, in fact, react with shock when human remains were found within the dirt. Upon further examination, there was also a casket, but that casket had collapsed. It appears from how it's worded that the weather may have washed the remains away from the casket. Unfortunately, some of the remains were never recovered. Because there was no pelvis found, it was unfortunate that they couldn't even provide an educated guess as to whether or not the person had been male or female. Or at least they felt they couldn't provide that. They did note that there were portions of what appeared to be a Victorian-era casket that included nickel-plated handles and coffin keys. It turns out that the location was the former home of Woodland Cemetery. However, over 100 years ago, in 1900, the town had opted to relocate much of the remains from this site, and this was done in order to construct a school on that very location. By the 1930s, however, what was left intact of the Woodland Cemetery was overgrown and neglected, and it was, of course, no longer being used as its original purpose. No one was being buried there. It was then that the town of Samford decided to relocate the remaining graves in order to install a playground for the school that was there. The authorities found an article from 1931 that reported that 72 people were relocated to Oakdale Cemetery, which was located about a mile away. It appears in total there had been 77 graves, and they believed all had been moved, except that wasn't what happened. Much like the case I covered on John Barber, who was older and actually surprisingly interesting, the problem is that you can't just respectfully place a person back in the grave without knowing who they were. But DNA is a lot more complicated when you get farther away in the tree. And of course, when someone passed years before, there really isn't a lot of option other than exhuming a possible relative and testing that DNA. One of those in charge of finding out who she was was a local historian named Paul Auger. Paul later made the statement, we want to honor whoever this person was and treat them with respect. And they did. They searched with dedication, eventually finding her name with the help of Parabon Nano Labs. At this location, they found her finger bones, jawbone, teeth, and ribs. It was eventually determined that Edith Patton lived from 1867 to 1891. They originally estimated she was one decade old. I apologize for wording it weirdly, but YouTube turns off my comments if I mention a younger age. They do it for a valid reason, but this isn't it. And in this case, it turns out she was actually 24 when she passed, although that is unfortunately far too young. If they determined her COD, it's not listed. Sanford, Maine is pretty small. It has about 22,000 people. And as such, they likely had limited means. However, they saw this case as important, and they funded it themselves, finally allowing Edith to be reburied with her real name. Edith Patton went unidentified for six years, but had been buried there 126 years before. Edith lived a short life from 1867 to 1891. The Pierre John Doe, identified as Stephen Earl Boyce. This one starts almost five decades ago on April 9, 1976, when a fisherman was floating along the Missouri River east of Pierre, South Dakota. It was here he found a person floating in the water. That person was fully clothed and near a campground in the area. It appeared to be an accidental event, but they just were unable to identify him. He was around 5'5", five five or 165 centimeters. He had blonde hair and a receding hairline. It was just too little to go on. And of course, since no one was reported missing from the area, it made it that much harder. They did provide the drawing here as a recreation, but it led to no one. This gave them the working theory that the man was from another state. And in fact, a road map was found in his pocket, which appears to back that up. But in 1976, there weren't any databases where all the information was kept in. So, of course, specific jurisdictions weren't speaking with each other. 
and there was no DNA, obviously, to use. He was buried in Riverside Cemetery in Pierre with a marker that read, Unknown Man. The next move in this case happened in 2020. It was at a time cold cases were being reopened by Pierre police, and at this time a permit was obtained to exhume his remains. From this point on, they built his DNA profile, and they were successfully able to use genetic genealogy. We know now that Stephen Earl Boyce was 39 and from Seattle, Washington, far from home as he was traveling through South Dakota. One thing that makes me really sad about this case is the only photo we have, or at least at the time that I was doing this, I will check when I finalize the video, but the only photo available was Stephen Boyce in an old arrest photo, where his eyes aren't even open. Sometimes I can remove the backgrounds and make it look more respectful, sometimes like a regular picture, but this one is impossible. I really hate to leave it looking this way, but I also want to pay tribute to him with his image. Stephen Earl Boyce was found in Pierre, South Dakota, which is 1,280 miles away from home, or 2,060 kilometers, from his home in Seattle, Washington. Stephen Earl Boyce went unidentified for 46 years. Had he lived, he would be 85 years old today. The Madera County Jane Doe, identified as Christine Lester. Christine Lester was from Indian Wells, Arizona, and she was known to be heading to Flagstaff to shop for a present, and this was the last time she was ever seen. She got a ride part of the way from a family member and was planning on hitchhiking the rest of the way, something which her family described as being very normal in the area at the time, and this was in 1987. Christine's sisters, Shauna and LaBrenda, were there and remember it clearly. Christine was 24 and was heading out from the Navajo Nation to the Flagstaff Mall because she wanted to get both her mother and her grandmother gifts that were meant for Mother's Day, which was to happen in five days. They would say she hitchhiked all the time and she'd never had any problems at all. She told her uncle that day that she'd be back by the time he got off work, but she was never seen or heard from again. They filed a missing persons report as soon as they were allowed, and for the rest of the years they waited and hoped that she would walk through the door again, fantasizing that she would perhaps come there and introduce her family to them. Instead, a call came that was both wanted and hated. She wasn't living her life anywhere at all. She had in fact been found on Mother's Day in Madera County, California, which is about 724 miles away or 1,165 kilometers. Her family has no idea if she ever made it to Tucson at all or if she was taken directly to where she was found by whoever it was who picked her up hitchhiking. Her sister Shauna would say she was crushed by the news, saying, I didn't want to hear it. I wanted her to come home. The answer came when genetic genealogy eventually matched with her brother and provided the answer they never wanted to be true. Christine was found by a tractor-trailer driver in rural Madera County, California. And authorities described the Jane Doe as tall and thin, likely of Asian descent, and around 30 to 50 years old. The COD was foul play, but the cause wasn't ever released. And they were clear that this was on purpose. They're hoping the information can be used to arrest the perpetrator. Unfortunately, the case went cold, and no one was locally reported missing where she was found. The family received an explicit hateful letter in 1992 or 1993, and this letter was so bad that they kept it. Shauna stated that this letter was weird, that while they didn't believe Christine had a boyfriend, the letter pretended that she did. They also didn't believe she would do any of the explicit things mentioned in the letter. The letter is now in the hands of the authorities. Her two sisters and brother transported her remains from Flagstaff to a family plot on the reservation saying a service there to say goodbye. They've issued a desperate plea for anyone with any information to come forward. As for leads, they would say that there are several investigative avenues they're approaching right now, but they need to keep them confidential. Christine Lester went unidentified for 36 years. Had she lived, she would be 60 years old today. Huge thanks for watching all the way to the end. If you are at all interested in helping crowdfund John and Jane Doe cases, I've provided links to the DNA Doe Project and DNA Solves below.
Both of those allow you to pick the cases you help fund. Thanks everyone for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other.